in February, the president announced uh, he was moving thousands of high-ranking gang members to the country's new so-called mega jail. Since then, there has been no information released. A new discovery has been found inside the prisons of El Salvador, and it's a game-changer. The most intriguing part of this, however, is how this new development could shake up the way the entire world sees prisons and the people in them. Stay with us till the end of the video, as we take a closer look at what's happening behind bars and why it matters so much. New Discovery in El Salvador's Prisons in El Salvador, a state of emergency has been in effect since March 27, 2022, following a day of extreme violence that resulted in 62 deaths. This measure, which has been extended monthly for two years, allows the government to detain individuals without formal charges for up to 15 days and limits certain civil liberties, such as the right to assemble and access legal counsel. President Nayib Bukele, who has been at the forefront of this campaign, has overseen the arrest of over 78,000 individuals suspected of gang affiliations, although approximately 7,000 have been released due to insufficient evidence. The centerpiece of this crackdown is the Terrorist Confinement Center, a new maximum security facility that has quickly become notorious for its harsh conditions. Since its opening, the prison's population has surged, with a recent influx of 2,000 inmates. The Justice Minister has made it clear that those incarcerated there are not expected to re-enter society. Despite this, human rights groups have raised concerns about potential abuses and the arbitrary nature of of the arrests, which they claim often rely on superficial criteria like appearance or neighborhood. The government's approach has been both lauded and criticized. Bukele, who once called himself the world's coolest dictator, has used social media to showcase the mass transfers of inmates to the facility, emphasizing the administration's tough stance on crime. Yet, with tens of thousands still awaiting trial, the effectiveness and fairness of these measures remain under scrutiny. As the country continues to grapple with one of the highest crime rates in Latin America, the debate over the balance between security and human rights persists. El Salvador's approach to combating crime has garnered significant support from its citizens with President Bukele's policies leading to a notable decrease in violence. The country, once plagued by one of the highest homicide rates globally, has seen a dramatic transformation. Bukele's strategy, encapsulated in a tweet, credits the success to incarcerating criminals, which has resulted in 200 days without a single homicide reported. This shift has positioned El Salvador as a leader in safety within the Americas. However, this success has not been without controversy. Critics argue that the long-term sustainability of Bukele's methods is questionable, as a society cannot solely rely on imprisonment to resolve its security issues. Carolina Jimenez, the head of WOLA, a non-profit organization focusing on Latin America, expressed concerns via Twitter about the lack of a comprehensive crime prevention strategy, suggesting that the government's reliance on a perpetual state of emergency could lead to human rights infringements. The Salvadoran Congress has consistently renewed the state of emergency since its inception in March 2022 following that tragic day when gang violence claimed the lives of 62 individuals. This emergency status has led to the suspension of several rights, including the right to assembly, the right to be informed about the reasons for arrest, and access to legal representation. Under these conditions, the police are not required to disclose the reasons for an arrest, and detainees can be held for up to 15 days without judicial review, a significant increase from the previous limit of 72 hours. The impact of these policies is evident in the nation's prison system. As of April 2021, the prison population was reported to be nearly 36,000, with facilities operating at 120% capacity. In the subsequent months, the government has effectively tripled the number of inmates, reflecting the aggressive nature of the anti-crime campaign and raising questions about the balance between public safety and individual rights. The discovery of thousands more individuals being jailed in the terrorist confinement center has exposed a system that is deeply flawed and in dire need of reform. According to the critics, it is not enough to simply imprison individuals. The focus must shift towards rehabilitation and reintegration into society. And, without addressing the root causes of gang violence and implementing effective rehabilitation programs, the cycle of violence will continue to perpetuate. Looking back, the seeming launch of the terrorist confinement. Center was epic. It was in the early hours of February 24, 2023, when this monumental event took place in El Salvador. President Nayib Bukele's war on crime reached a new level as the first 2,000 inmates were transferred to the Center for the Confinement of Terrorism.
Prism, CECOT, a prison specifically built to accommodate over 40,000 suspected gang members. This transfer marked the beginning of a new era in the country's fight against crime, but it also raised serious concerns about human rights violations. President Bukele proudly announced the operation. He described the facility as the largest prison in the Americas, emphasizing that it would serve as the new home for these individuals, where they would be confined for decades, unable to cause further harm to the population. However, this bold move did not come without controversy. Human rights organizations quickly condemned the state of emergency that President Bukele had invoked to make these arrests. They accused the government of engaging in mass arbitrary detention, torture, and other forms of ill treatment against detainees. In a statement, Human Rights Watch highlighted the alarming violations, including deaths in custody and abuse-ridden prosecutions. The state of emergency had empowered the government to act with impunity, leading to serious concerns about the protection of basic human rights. A video posted by President Bukila further fueled the outrage. The footage showed the barefoot, tattooed men, wearing nothing but white boxers, bent over with their hands behind their shaven heads. Armed guards in balaclavas stood watch over them as they were loaded onto buses, their hands and feet shackled. The convoy that transported them to Seacott included helicopters, showing the gravity of the situation. Upon arrival at the new facility, the inmates were lined up in large groups, awaiting their entry into the cells. Journalists and onlookers were present as they were led into the prison, providing a glimpse into the stark reality that awaited them. Inside the cells, the inmates were left sitting on the floor next to stacked metal beds. Shockingly, the warden revealed that no mattresses would be provided, leaving the inmates to endure the discomfort of a bare floor. The treatment of these inmates has sparked outrage and raised questions about the conditions they will face during their confinement. Critics argue that the lack of basic amenities, such as mattresses, violates their rights and dignity. The absence of proper bedding further highlights the harshness of the environment they are subjected to. As the news of the transfer spread, international human rights organizations intensified their scrutiny of the situation. And, just like the recent developments, they called for an immediate investigation into the treatment of inmates and the conditions at Seacott. Despite the controversies surrounding Seacott and the treatment of inmates, President Bukele's aggressive crackdown on gangs has garnered significant public support within El Salvador. Opinion polls indicate that more than 90% of the population approves of the government's efforts to tackle the gang problem. The operation's mass arrests have resulted in a significant decrease in killings and extortion, providing a sense of relief to the public. El Salvador's Mega Prison Nestled in the municipality of Tecoluca, the terrorist confinement center, also known as Secot, stands as a formidable structure in the landscape of San Vicente, El Salvador. Inaugurated in January 2023 by President Nayib Bukele, this maximum security prison was constructed as a direct response to the country's escalating gang violence, which reached a harrowing peak on March 26, 2022, with the deadliest day in Salvadoran history. The establishment of Secot marked a pivotal moment in the Salvadoran government's extensive crackdown on criminal gangs. Over 55,000 individuals were swiftly arrested in the seven months following the declaration of a state of exception, which suspended certain laws and constitutional rights to expedite the roundup of gang members. This mass detention led to the urgent need for a facility like Secot, designed to alleviate the severe overcrowding in existing prisons such as Zacatecoluca. With a staggering capacity to house 40,000 inmates, Secot is not only the largest prison in Latin America, but also a symbol of the government's unyielding stance against gang-related terrorism. The first 2,000 inmates were transferred under the cloak of night, escorted by a heavy security detail composed of the Salvadoran police and army. This high security environment is devoid of any privileges or comforts, ensuring that the most dangerous criminals in El Salvador are held in a setting that reflects the gravity of their crimes against society. Constructed with concrete and steel, Secot has been dubbed the Alcatraz of Central America. It is a fortress-like facility, designed to keep the inmates securely confined. The compound is surrounded by two electrified fences and two reinforced concrete walls, creating an impenetrable barrier. The facility is also guarded by 19 towers, making it a place where escape seems nearly impossible. The entire plot of land dedicated to Seacott covers a vast area of 410 acres, with the physical complex itself spanning approximately 57 acres. The prison was purposefully built in an isolated area, away from public institutions, urban centers, and any contact with the outside world. 
the layout of C-Cot is designed to ensure maximum security and control over the inmates. The prison consists of eight main cell blocks, covering an area of approximately 50,000 square meters, equivalent to 540,000 square feet. Each cell block is divided into modules, with each module containing two toilets, two washing basins, and 80 bunks. As for the bunks, they do not have mattresses, providing minimal comfort for the inmates. It, therefore, goes without saying that the living conditions within Seacott are harsh and austere. Inmates have constant access to the washing basins, but the water is controlled by guards from outside the cell. This limited access to water adds to the challenging conditions faced by the inmates. According to Financial Times, on average, each prisoner is given only 0.6 square meters or 6.5 square feet of living space. This lack of space is a stark contrast to the overcrowded conditions in El Salvador's other prisons. In addition to the main cell blocks, Sicot also has corridors of solitary confinement cells. These cells are stark and minimalistic, with only a concrete slab for sleeping, a toilet, and a washing basin. When new inmates come to the prison, they go through a detailed security check. They have to pass through a high-tech x-ray scan to make sure they don't bring in anything they're not supposed to. Prisoner enters here. His whole body is searched with a technology that allows us to literally see if there is anything inside his body. Once inside, new arrivals at Seacott are quickly signed up with their personal and criminal history recorded. The prison is also always watched by cameras, has a fence that can shock with 15,000 volts and keeps weapons and riot gear ready. And no one in prison can have visitors. When it comes to the layout, the terrorist confinement center is separated into different parts, including some areas where people are kept alone in very simple cells with just a bed, toilet, and sink, and no light. Guards can peek into these cells through a little window. And to Sacker, the facility, there are 1,000 guards, 600 soldiers, and 250 police officers. That's about 40 prisoners for every guard. There are 19 towers where guards keep watch, with seven outside and 12 inside, each with seven soldiers. The guards have their own places to rest, play games like ping pong, take care of personal needs, store their stuff, and work out. As of September 2023, the population within Seacott's walls has surpassed 12,500 inmates, with the number expected to rise as the government continues its relentless campaign against gang affiliations. The living conditions in Seco are far from comfortable. Inmates are housed in cells with four-tier bunk beds, where they sleep without any mattresses or sheets. The bare metal is their only respite from the unforgiving conditions of their confinement. Basic amenities are also scarce within the cells. Inmates are provided with minimal meals consisting of rice, beans, hard-boiled eggs, or pasta, which they eat with their hands. The director of Seco explains that any utensil can be fashioned into a deadly weapon, necessitating this unconventional approach to dining. Daily life in Seco is marked by strict routines and limited opportunities for exercise and social interaction. Inmates spend the majority of their day confined to their cells, with only 30 minutes allotted for exercise. This exercise is limited to using their own body weight in the central corridor. The prison is heavily guarded by hooded personnel who keep watch from above, armed with guns. Their presence serves as a constant reminder of the strict control and surveillance within Sakot. Within the three cement walls of their cells, inmates have access to two sinks and two toilets, which they must use in plain sight of everyone else. Privacy is a luxury they are not afforded. With limited activities and no access to entertainment, inmates spend their days watching time go by. The artificial lights in the prison cells are never turned off, creating an environment where day and night blur together. It is important to note that Sheikon is a massive complex consisting of eight blocks. The entire facility covers an area equivalent to seven football stadiums, emphasizing the scale of this confinement center. The lack of ventilation adds to the already challenging living conditions. The temperature inside the cells can reach up to 35 degrees Celsius or 95 degrees Fahrenheit during the day, making it an incredibly uncomfortable environment for the inmates. That's not all. The absence of social interaction and the monotonous routine further intensifies the hardships faced by the inmates. They are isolated from the outside world, with no contact with family or friends, and limited opportunities for personal growth or rehabilitation. Bound at the wrists and ankles, the prisoners are usually escorted out of their cells to squat against the wall. There's no doubt that the inmates at the terrorist confinement center are those convicted for the worst of crimes. Take, for instance, one of the prisoners is known to have been involved with the Mara Salvatrucha gang. He is currently serving a sentence of 269 years for the abduction, torture, and killing of four soldiers, alongside with his accomplices. That's not all. Another inmate at the facility who has his torso-bearing tattoos, which are typical for gang members, 
is convicted of the femicide of a 16-year-old schoolgirl. According to reports, the girl was held captive and brutally murdered, her body dumped in a canal. Despite the gravity of the crimes of a large number of the inmates at Seacott, the conditions within prisons have come under serious criticisms. One of the bodies that has lent their voice to the issue is Christosal, a leading human rights group in Central America. The organization had been tracking the troubling trend since the declaration of a state of exception in 2022 when over 150 individuals died under state care alongside numerous instances of torture that were reported. This shift has also caught the attention of Amnesty International AI, which has raised concerns about a disturbing transition from gang-related violence to acts of aggression by the state itself. In addition to this, AI leveled serious allegations against Salvadoran officials, asserting that they have systematically employed torture against those arrested arrested during the state of emergency, suspecting them of gang affiliations. A report in 2022 further highlights the direst outcomes, including deaths while in state custody. AI further notes that many of these fatalities can be attributed to the harsh conditions of confinement or to the neglect of essential medical attention and medication. Despite these grave accusations, the prison's administration maintains a stance of isolation, barring any external oversight by disallowing visits from independent organizations or NGOs. Nevertheless, the director staunchly defends the institution's practices, claiming adherence to international norms and standards. However, as for the people of El Salvador itself, they are all too familiar with the heinous acts for which many prisoners are currently incarcerated, and they couldn't be happier about the inception of the terrorist confinement center. According to them, the period preceding the elections was something they dreaded. Vendors in bustling markets, guests in urban hotels, residents of modest communities, and visitors all shared a history of gang dominance that pervaded their lives until the state's intervention. Many also spoke of a time when their liberty to walk around their own neighborhoods was hindered by the gang's territorial reign. But now, all of those were in the past, thanks to the government clamping down on gangs. Crime in El Salvador the people of El Salvador are no strangers to crimes in the state. Going back in time to the Salvadoran Civil War, a brutal conflict that raged from 1979 to 1992. This war left an indelible mark on the people and the land of El Salvador. It was a time of political upheaval, social unrest, and unimaginable violence. The war pitted the military-led government against leftist guerrilla groups, resulting in a staggering loss of life and widespread destruction. As the war raged on, many Salvadorans sought refuge in the United States, particularly in the city of Los Angeles. Little did they know that their presence in the US would have far-reaching consequences for their homeland. In the streets of Los Angeles, a new breed of gangs was born, including the notorious Mara Salvatrucha, or MS-13, and the 18th Street Gang. These gangs thrived in the harsh environment of Los Angeles, engaging in drug trafficking, extortion, and violence. However, as the US government cracked down on gang activities, many members were deported back to El Salvador, bringing with them their criminal expertise and a reign of terror. The deportation of these gang members back to El Salvador marked a turning point in the country's crime landscape. The streets of El Salvador became a battleground as these powerful and ruthless gangs fought for control, leaving innocent civilians caught in the crossfire. The impact of the civil war, coupled with the influx of deported gang members, created a perfect storm for the rise of crime in El Salvador. The country was left grappling with deep-rooted issues such as poverty, inequality, and a lack of opportunities. For many young Salvadorans, joining a gang offered a sense of belonging and protection in a society plagued by despair. But the consequences of gang involvement were devastating. These gangs expanded their criminal enterprises to include drug trafficking, human trafficking, and even sex trafficking. The tentacles of their operations reached far and wide, leaving a trail of destruction in their wake. In 2012, El Salvador experienced a glimmer of hope when a gang truce was brokered, leading to a significant drop in crime. But this fragile peace was short-lived. In 2014, the truce collapsed, and the murder rate skyrocketed once again. The streets of El Salvador became a battleground, with innocent civilians paying the price. The government of El Salvador has implemented various strategies to combat gang violence and reduce crime. One such approach is the implementation of policies like La Mano Dura and Super Mano Dura, which translate to Firm Hand and Super Firm Hand, respectively. These policies aim to crack down on gang activities through increased law enforcement presence and harsher penalties. However, these approaches have faced criticism for their heavy-handedness and alleged human rights abuses. Critics argue that these policies often target marginalized communities and result in the further marginalization of vulnerable individuals. The challenge lies in finding a balance between maintaining law and order and protecting the rights of the citizens. 
In addition to law enforcement efforts, the government has also implemented programs to address the root causes of gang involvement. These programs aim to provide alternatives for at-risk youth, offering education, vocational training, and employment opportunities. By addressing the underlying issues of poverty, family disintegration, and a lack of opportunities, the government hopes to steer vulnerable individuals away from a life of crime. Non-government organizations like Homies Unidos also play a crucial role in preventing violence and gang membership among youth. These organizations provide mentorship, counseling, and support to at-risk individuals, helping them break free from the cycle of violence and find a path towards a brighter future. Despite these efforts, the challenges in combating gang violence in El Salvador remain immense. The gangs continue to adapt and evolve, finding new ways to exert their influence and maintain control. The government's battle against crime is an ongoing struggle, one that requires a multifaceted approach and a long-term commitment. Another approach initiated by El Salvador was the implementation of truces between the government and the gangs in 2012. For a brief period, these truces led to a significant drop in crime, offering a glimmer of hope for a safer El Salvador. However, the truces were short-lived. In 2014, they collapsed, and the murder rate skyrocketed once again. The reasons for the failure of these truces are complex, with critics arguing that they provided temporary relief without addressing the underlying issues that fuel gang violence. In response to the escalating violence, the government has also resorted to the use of military force. The deployment of the military in the streets of El Salvador was intended to restore law and order, but it has faced criticism for its heavy-handed approach and alleged human rights abuses. The challenges faced by El Salvador in addressing crime and violence are deeply rooted in social, economic, and political factors. Poverty, inequality, and a lack of opportunities continue to drive vulnerable individuals into the arms of gangs. The government's efforts to address these issues through education, vocational training, and employment opportunities are crucial, but they require long-term commitment and sustained investment. Another challenge lies in the deeply entrenched culture of violence that permeates society. Generations have grown up in an environment where violence is normalized, making it difficult to break free from this cycle. Changing this culture requires a comprehensive approach that involves not only law enforcement, but also education, community engagement, and the promotion of positive values. Once again, the government's crackdown on gangs, such as the implementation of policies like La Mano Dura and Super Mano Dura, has faced criticism for its focus on punishment rather than prevention. Critics argue that these approaches often result in the further marginalization of vulnerable communities and fail to address the root causes of gang involvement. But, despite these challenges, there are glimmers of hope in El Salvador's fight against crime and violence. Tonight, El Salvador is under state of emergency after a deadly weekend of gang violence. The National Civil Police reporting 14 people murdered on Friday and 62 the following day, making Saturday one of the deadliest days in 30 years. In 2015, El Salvador was labeled the most violent country in the Western Hemisphere, with a homicide rate of 103 per 100,000 people, which amounted to 6,650 homicides that year. By 2018, the rate had decreased to 52 homicides per 100,000 people, or 3,340 homicides. While the government reveled in this seeming victory, a sudden speak in violence was observed between April 24 and 27, 2020, when 77 people were murdered. The government, led by President Bukela, suggested that the increase was orchestrated by gang members from within the prisons. So, as a countermeasure, the government enforced a lockdown in all prisons, confining inmates to their cells 24-7 and intermixing rival gang members. The government also publicized photos showing the crowded conditions of prisoners crammed together on the floors of their cells. The alarming spikes in murders that happened between April 2020 and March 2022 was what prompted the government to take drastic measures. President Nayib Bukele, determined to tackle the escalating violence, declared a war against gangs known as the Salvadoran Gang Crackdown or Guerra Contra las Pandillas. The government attributed the increase in violence to criminal gangs and implemented measures to expand the powers of law enforcement. Since the crackdown began in March 2022, over 77,000 people accused of gang affiliations have been arrested. This massive wave of arrests has resulted in overcrowded prisons and has pushed El Salvador to have the highest incarceration rate in the world. The government's approach to the crackdown has been very aggressive. Additional police and military forces have been deployed to target known gang strongholds. Raids and checkpoints have become a common sight in neighborhoods with a significant gang presence. The aim is to disrupt gang activity 
activities and restore peace and security to the country. Also, to combat the escalating gang violence, the government of El Salvador declared a state of exception. This extraordinary measure suspended certain rights and expanded law enforcement powers, granting authorities the ability to take swift and decisive action against criminal gangs. The state of exception, initially implemented in response to the spike in murders in March 2022, has been extended multiple times by the Legislative Assembly. Each extension has prolonged the suspension of rights and the expansion of law enforcement powers, allowing the government to continue its aggressive crackdown on criminal gangs. To reinforce these stringent rules, the government has intensified its crackdown on gang activity. Police and military units have been dispatched en masse, conducting raids, establishing checkpoints around gang-infested neighborhoods, and rigorously inspecting individuals. Those deemed suspects are subjected to invasive searches to uncover any gang-affiliated tattoos. In fact, these raids, checkpoints, and increased surveillance have become the norm in neighborhoods with a significant gang presence. In a sweeping reform, the political party Nuevas Ideas has overhauled sentencing laws, significantly increasing the incarceration time for gang leaders to a range of 40 to 45 years, up from the previous 6 to 9. The sentences for rank-and-file gang members have also risen, now sitting at 20 to 30 years, compared to the former 3 to 5. Moreover, the age at which one can be held criminally responsible has been lowered from 16 to 12 years. In a bold move, the new legislation also imposes a 10 to 15 year prison sentence on anyone found broadcasting or spreading gang communications, including members of the press. The crackdown's impact was immediate and profound. By the close of March 27th, over 576 arrests had been made, a number that ballooned to nearly 6,000 within just a week. This surge in detentions has put a strain on the already Already packed prisons. Despite this, the government has not relented, urging law enforcement and the judiciary to persist with the mass arrests, even setting quotas. One month into the emergency state, the arrest tally exceeded 17,000. By May 25th, the National Civil Police reported over 34,500 arrests. Amidst this aggressive campaign, many families remain in the dark about the whereabouts or reasons for their loved ones' detentions. In a controversial cost-saving measure, President Bukili has cut prisoner meals to two a day, consisting solely of beans and tortillas, asserting that he will not divert funds from education to feed some terrorists. And so, President Bukele's administration took a monumental step in July 2022 by initiating the construction of a colossal new prison. This facility, designed to accommodate 40,000 inmates, was dubbed the Terrorism Confinement Center. It commenced operations on January 31, 2023, in Tekaluka. Also, in a parallel effort to eradicate the symbols of gang influence, the Justice Minister declared on November 3, 2022, a campaign to dismantle the gravestones of gang members. This measure aims to prevent these memorials from being venerated as shrines, thereby stripping criminals of posthumous honor. While the gravestones face destruction, the government assures that the interred remains will be left undisturbed. What do you think about the terrorist confinement center and its inmates? Share your thoughts in the comments. Also, to watch more videos with equally captivating content, click on one of the cards appearing on your scene now.